it's my pleasure to welcome two excellent uh, speakers, uh, both of whom are going to speak about uh, about cities, about uh, urban dynamics, but from very different perspectives. Perspectives. The first speaker is going to be Herr Neusings, who will speak about uh, if cars could walk post-socialist street between circulation and conviviality. Herr Neusings is a social anthropologist, professor for social anthropology with a focus on Southeastern Europe at the University of Regensburg since 2014, if I'm um, correct. Uh, he is also spokesperson, speaker, quite a main coordinator of a large project that uh, we launched in Regensburg uh, this year to expand and further develop Southeast European studies. And the, Re the cooperation with the Rijeka, with the University of Rijeka, is very much part of this project. Uh, before coming to Regensburg, uh, he uh, belongs to the faculty of the School for Slavonic and East European studies at UCL in London, which is the second most important place to study Southeastern Europe after Regensburg. First. Um, Kevin Kanja uh, speaks to us from Rijeka, I guess, uh, although he technically, and not only technically, he is uh, also in Berkeley, uh, although not physically at the moment, because he is PhD in, in, in the PhD uh, program at the University of California in, in, in Berkeley. It's the PhD in history, right? Uh, and, anthropology, uh, yeah. Anthropology, right. So we have two anthropologists talking to us, and uh, Kevin has an MA from uh, from the CU in uh, in nationalism studies, and uh, uh, he is uh, he is doing a really very important work on on Bosnia. And he's going to speak about renaming memory lane, street naming practices in Sarajevo from the Ottoman area era to the post-socialist post-war. Present. So two talks that innovate will speak about streets, but from very different perspectives. But that's a great combination. Um, you know the rules. So you have maximum 30 minutes. You don't necessarily need to exploit the 30 minutes. Uh, and then we have kind of 50 minutes for Q&A after each, each talk. And by at least at last uh, 10 or uh, 1 o'clock, we should be. Uh, we should be done. I also welcome uh, Vienna Pavlakovic students from his class. I hope you're all here. If not, we will tell Vienna. Um, and you're, of course, also invited to ask uh, questions after the two presentations. The first one will be Herr and uh, yeah. Kevin. Herr, uh, you have a presentation to share with us. Yeah, I do have. Uh, so I need to uh, look at uh, how I'm going to share this now. So let me just check whether this is straightforward. I think the moment I do it on present and on view, how do you say that uh, uh, on the usual view? Can you see this now? Or? Yes. Yeah. But you're, you're not in presentation view. Exactly. When I do presentation view, I can't see you anymore, as my experience. So I'm going to do this now. Uh, I, yeah, I do see myself also. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, what I'm going to um, talk about is urban transformations that have not been explored or analyzed in, in detail because of the kind of mundane and ephemeral quality of the empirical materials, the streets, life, traffic behavior, and interaction. And here you have a small, nice photo that kind of, uh, um, oh, that kind of shows the the kind of contradiction that I, uh, is in the in the title. If cars could walk, uh, here is a an advertising advertisement for for Audi in Bucharest, uh, which, uh, if I translate the Romanian phrase, is one step ahead. Uh, that's of course Walker uh, terminology, but uh, cars uh, obviously can also um, make steps ahead uh, in that sense. Now, uh, my talk. Uh, will will deal with um, with street life, particularly when talking about post-socialist cities. Um, I would say the emphasis is usually on the uh, tangible, visible changes, uh, primarily in the built environment, like architectural interventions, increasing residential segregation, urban sprawl, the renaming of streets. Uh, we will hear more about that later. Um, 
And these uh, usual explorations, I would say, focus on the material and spatial transformations and do not necessarily look at how it affects people from, let's say, an anthropological uh, perspective. But this talk is based uh, on a workshop that I organized in Regensburg in 2016, together with the Estonian geographer Tauri Tuvikine. Um, at the moment, we are preparing a, an edited volume on the basis of this workshop to be published in 2023 with Berkheim. I'm actually in Tallinn now to do the final um, part of, of the work for the, for the volume. And today's talk provides you with a kind of pre-publication taster of the, of the key arguments. Um, First of all, urban street life has long enjoyed interest from scholars, writers, and artists, but not necessarily in the socialist or post-socialist con context. So the vibrancy of the street spawning kind of chance encounters and forms of productive friction has been no small part of its uh, enduring and attraction. So in my talk, I will look at street life in post-socialist cities, how uh, this has changed after 1989. Post-socialism, however much it continues to be debated as a concept and as a lived uh, reality has hardly ever been explored at the street level, as I would call this, which involves uh, looking at micro scale everyday and face-to-face -face interactions in streets and public uh, spaces as, for example, Irving Goffman famously did in his book, uh, Relations in Public, Micro Studies of the Public Order in 71. In our book, we explore post-socialist streets as key sites for mobility, uh, dwelling, and social interaction. In the transformation from socialist to post-socialist, streets have radically changed because of the unparalleled growth of private car mobility in most post-socialist cities. Whereas in the post in the in the capitalist West, automobiles became a dominant feature of urban streets via a gradual process that spanned the entire 20th century. In the former socialist uh, East, uh, between inverted commas, cars uh, hit the streets in greater numbers only during the 1990s and the 2000s. Under, under socialism, um, as we all know, private car ownership remained a rare priv privilege of the few who usually waited for years to obtain a car. And in the post-socialist era, cars, usually foreign and second-hand cars, became suddenly widely available, reflecting the new values of privacy, uh, property, and um, flexibility. And this has indeed led to radically uh, transformed street escapes. And here you see, for instance, book, uh, an image from Bucharest in 91, really a central square in Bucharest without cars, pedestrians able to, tr to, tr uh, you know, to cross the street without any issues. And, these are some images from uh, my own research in, in, let's say, the 2010s, uh, where you see congested streets with uh, complicated traffic uh, situations. So these uh, transformed uh, streetscapes is what we try to address ethnographically and conceptually in the book. Um, Albania, for instance, is a good example. The country had no... Uh, private cars until 1991, when the ban on private vehicle ownership was lifted by the first post-socialist government. The number of uh, private uh, cars shot up from zero in 1990 to 300,000 in 2007. And now with a population of 3 million, Albania has more than half a million registered ve uh, vehicles. And similar changes occurred everywhere across the formerly socialist world with uh, citizens seeking to catch up with the supposedly more advanced uh, West. Socialist public transport was uh, supplanted by a surging car culture, which in fulfilling citizens' long deferred uh, consumerist dreams changed how they moved around and used streets and public spaces. Uh, now, private um, cars and 
and uh, or private mobilities and forms of habitation emerged, uh, including forms of uh, what we call mobile dwelling that happens in motion, so within the protective cocoon of the uh, private uh, car. It makes a difference, however, where one observes these, these changes. One has always to be sensitive uh, to local context and past dependencies. We believe that for that kind of fine-grained analysis, ethnography is a key method. An example in the volume is the chapter on Pristina, uh, which uh, is based on uh, Rita Gagita's master thesis, thesis, which I supervised, which describes in great uh, ethnographic detail the contradictions of street life after the end of the 1999 war. On the one hand, streets in Pristina became kind of liberated spaces, allowing new forms of performative behavior, interaction, and public deliberation that were impossible before. On the other hand, Pristina's heavily now congested streets became sites of friction. New post-war hierarchies are expressed in traffic, while ordinary citizens find kind of creative solutions to cope with traffic conditions and the perennial parking problems. So I think ethnographic approaches are essential, even though uh, scholars, especially historians and geographers have shown interest in streets, for example, in renaming practices after the end of socialism, uh, micro scale ethnographies of everyday life and uh, the vernacular strategies of adaptation to the new circumstances in post socialist streets are indeed, indeed lodging, largely lacking. And the intention of the book is indeed to bring these lived experiences to the attention of uh, you know, practitioners of other disciplines like traffic engineers, urban planners, and transportation experts. So the book is kind of ethnographic and observational on the one hand, but also theoretical on the other, offering uh, various reflections that we hope will be translated into design by urban planners and traffic uh, engineers. So um, in terms of other disciplines that have looked at street life in history, the available literature focuses on car mobility and automotive production under socialism when talking about Southeastern Europe or Eastern Europe and the growth of a consumerist car culture during late socialism in competition uh, with uh, the West. So here you have um, a few titles, by the way, Irving Goffman's uh, book that I already mentioned is on the left. Worth mentioning are the two books published by Louis Ziegelbaum, his monograph Cars for Comrades from 2008, and then his edited volume, The Socialist Car from 2011. These studies pay no attention to clashes with other transport modalities or the transformation of streets into car dominated spaces, as this had actually not happened at the time. They also do not track the changes into the post-socialist uh, period. So in our volume, we actually ask what this post-socialist car invasion has meant for the urban fabric of cities. We question the love affair with the car and as, uh, as well as the unthinking acceptance of car enabling urban planning measures, which have marginalized, let's say the social functions of streets turning them into roads, the function of which is to meet the exigencies of motorized vehicles. Hence, we shift attention away from a focus on circulation, as is very common amongst traffic engineers, for example, towards the convivial aspects of life in public spaces, following in the, in the footsteps of uh, thinkers like uh, Jane Jacobs, Ivan Illich, and Richard Sennett. So we perceive streets indeed to be ultimately social spaces that cannot be reduced to their role as mobility corridors. What makes the post-socialist context particularly interesting is the unprecedented pace of change and the drama, let's say, caused by radical regime change. Cars have suddenly become the dominant mode of mobility 
causing uh, problems that were unknown under socialism, uh, such as heavy congestion. Local variations, though, are very important. Transformations take place at different speeds and scales and with varying intensity in different uh, sites. So there are huge differences between capital cities, for example, and second tier and smaller towns, which are often uh, stagnant and shrinking demographically. The material legacies from socialism, the built environment and inherited infrastructure may resist change in ways that are locally specific, allowing for different kinds of uh, historical continuities from socialism to the post-socialist period. Also leading to a diversity of experiences of post-socialism. And these transformations constitute, I would say, singular historical experiences and trajectories trajectories for specific, uh, specific former socialist uh, uh, contexts and localities. The book also engages with uh, concerns around uh, urban governments and the right to the city, a term coming from David Harvey, in a part of the world that was subjected to the shock therapy of neoliberal reforms. These reforms led to the new post totalitarian openings, let's say streets and public spaces, for example, began to offer opportunities for political protest in marked contrast with the controlled and regimented public sphere of the socialist period. The art historian uh, Piotr Piotrowski has argued that this opening up of public spaces after the end of socialism led to a surge in what he calls agoraphilia, revealing a drive to enter the public space, the desire to participate in that space, uh, to shape public life. Uh, I quoted him now. In the former uh, GDR, for example, a defining feature of Die Wende in 89, uh, and years after was that people went, went on the streets, making streets into sites for demonstrations, celebrations, and car parades. In our book, we look at this agoraphilia, not so much from the perspective of its political manifestations, but rather from the mundane viewpoint of everyday life. The right to the city is not uh, just, um, wait a minute, it's not just, um, um, the right to the, wait a minute, lost track a bit. Uh, the right to the cities, a uh, city is not just the right to raise on occasion one's voice, but also to be present and uh, insert oneself into public spaces and shape urban futures. Still in uh, certain countries in the post-socialist world, the streets and public spaces remain under strict agoraphobic uh, surveillance, to use another of Piotrowski's terms. Authorities assert themselves violently, as we know, because as an anti-government protest in Eastern Europe and beyond show, losing streets to protesters means losing control. Even if the state's regimentation of public space is unavoidable, streets always retain elements of the public. Even if its publicness is suppressed, as during socialism, or in today's uh, commodified spaces, such as shopping malls, where protests are equally unwelcome. Citizens, and particularly artists, I would say, have found ways of subverting the spatial order, carving out niches of relative freedom uh, at semi-private or, or exurban uh, sites. So um, every city consists um, of a complex meshwork of streets and roads. And we, want, we distinguish between streets and roads, making some sort of ideal, typical distinction between these two uh, concepts. Uh, as cars have invaded uh, streets and roads, we distinguish between uh, the two, between st streets and, and roads, even if the boundaries be between the two are not sharp and each can blend into the other. In brief, we define roads as thoroughfares, 
primarily facilitate facilitating motorized traffic, whereas streets are multifunctional convivial spaces that serve important social functions. Streets have many contradictory features, combining flow and friction, speed and slowness, and mobility and immobility. And as such, they are governed by formal and informal codes of conduct alike. Streets often include sidewalks and shops. According to the Doyenne of Street Studies, Jane Jacobs, in her classic book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities from 61, the ideal street has traffic flanked by broader sidewalks and a variety of shops on both sides. And lots of attentive eyes on the street, as she calls it, of residents and shopkeepers observing what is happening, allowing for a degree of public safety, trust and security. Uh, roads, on the other hand, primarily facilitate the flow of motorized traffic. So they are not accessible to all. Together with ring roads and highways, they provide the infrastructure for motorized uh, traffic. Their smooth surfaces make high speed and frictionless movement possible, excluding slower modes of, of transport. And as such, they are associated with speed, progress and modernity, marginalizing slower mo modes of mobility, such as walking. Uh, we fully agree with critical urbanists such as Jane Jacobs or David uh, or Peter Norton, for example, who've been highly critical of how high speed ve vehicular traffic transforms uh, streets into mobility corridors, thwarting their potential for conviviality. These corridors, traffic corridors, remain detached from the local context, so they impede interaction and negatively affect uh, the social fabric of a, of a local settlement or an urban neighborhood. Uh, vehicular traffic strips down people's communicative behavior. So moving around in cars leads to the suspension of social engagement with other participants in traffic and street dwellers, dissolving environmental awareness in the broadest sense, turning vehicles into what senators called cognition impaired machines. The other side of the coin is that motorized traffic, roads and arteries uh, enables the emergence of new neighborhoods such as gated communities at the peripheries of cities as I have uh, shown in my chapter on the periphery of Bucharest. In the book we uh, talk uh, about post-socialist streets in the plural rather than the post-socialist street, as the variations in this part of the world are considerable, leading to different paths of development. Socialist countries had, for example, extremely varied levels of car ownership and car mobility, to mention just one parameter. As I already mentioned, Albania banned completely private cars, um, while neighboring Yugoslavia developed a popular uh, socialist car culture, producing small, affordable uh, Zastavas for the, ma for the masses. In 1980, the uh, GDR had the highest share of privately owned cars in socialist Central and Eastern Europe, with 151 cars per thousand inhabitants, as compared to 31 cars, so just a fifth of that, per thousand in, in the Soviet Union and 11 per thousand in, in Romania. So these uh, are some figures from uh, around 1980. Many socialist countries had their own car brands and production plans. So as one author in the book argues, there are also continuities with the socialist period in this, in this respect. Because of this, um, we question the idea that post-socialist cities have been simply in transition, copy-pasting the car culture of the West. It is, it is a mistake to assume that the former uh, socialist countries simply reproduced trends in the West at the delay of four decades, as if socialism never happened. From our perspective, the situation is far more complex in that there are still dominant 
post-socialist legacies and post-socialist past dependencies that play a crucial role in what forms of uh, what forms mobility is taking. And because of this, we use the concept of chronotopes of unique configurations of time and space in specific cities and streets. Every uh, post-socialist chronotope in any given place has evolved from the locally specific socialist milieu and hence can not, never be a carbon copy of urban streetscapes in the West. So it's far better to think in terms of past dependencies and analyze uh, post-socialist streets as emerging from their uh, specific socialist forebears. Socialist legacies continue to play a role in the built environment and street layouts or other remnants like material and immaterial alike. So some general remarks about this transformation from socialist to post-socialist streets, a key aspects of all post-socialist streets, as I already indicated, is the explosive growth of private car mobility, overwriting the socialist legacies of public transport. Um, nevertheless, socialist practices may linger on. For example, the informal, let's say, survival strategies that developed out of socialist automobility, which was dominated by shortages of car parts, uh, for example, and they continue to inform post-socialist forms of bricolage and tinkering. Streets were controlled uh, uh, and mobility the patterns were prescribed from the top, favoring public transport and disallowing private car mobility under socialism. And if automobility existed, it was in the form of heavy vehicles uh, like trucks and buses, while smaller cars usually served the needs of the nomenclatura. Cars never dominated streets as they did in the capitalist West, yet like in the West, socialist modernity was also about acceleration and progress in all spheres of life and in, in, in order to leave the kind of proverbial backwardness of the pre-socialist pre period. Motorized vehicles and electric public transport became tokens of progress with um, the nomenclatura indeed claiming vehicles as their personal prerogative. As Emma Goldman already noted, uh, describing early revolutionary Russia in her book, My Disillusionment in Russia. One important difference with capitalist countries uh, was the dominant reliance on electrification. Instead of fossil fuels in urban transportation, which we argue gives East European cities a certain edge nowadays, env environmentally speaking, over their West European counterparts. In spite of these uh, socialist ideas of accelerated mobility, the 1980s and 1990s came then to be associated with stagnation, exemplified in the proverbial queues of people waiting for the bus or tram as public transport was crumbling. Uh, with cars dominating the cult cultural in imaginary nowadays, public transport is, is seen uh, currently with uh, disdain. Um, car ownership uh, became a marker of the break with the socialist past and the vehicle for expressing class distinctions between, let's say, the winners and losers of transition. As one of the chapters uh, in the book show, shows, uh, automobility became a mode of male self-fashioning. In the early post-socialist years, for example, men invested in expensive looking cars that would signal their success rather than in upgrades to their own private apartments. I know these stories for, for Bucharest. Uh, vehicles are symbolic in other ways, not only offering the means to express social difference, but also exemplifying the post-socialist moral order or lack thereof. Um, speed equals social status expressing liberation from a condition of subdued living without cars imposed by a rep repressive socialist state. 
Fast cars give drivers a sense of freedom, which is especially important for those with attitudes hostile to the state, as can be seen elsewhere too. In the feral years, right after the end of socialism, driving at high speeds on bad roads seemed to have compensated for the many lost years uh, spent without private cars, turning roads literally into graveyards, lined with numerous informal uh, cenotaphs and floral tributes for people killed in traffic accidents. The post-socialist condition is indeed discernible still in people's hostile attitude to the previously repressive state. Many car drivers not seeing the state as guaranteeing public order show disdain for state officials such as, um, such as uh, traffic police. Extreme and transgressive street practices, such as speeding, queue jumping, and various other forms of rule breaking, um, seem to be more widespread, making uh, traffic in cities such as Bucharest or Tirana look intimidating. As the state hardly ever punishes this behavior, uh, people continue to improvise and solve traffic and other existential issues by artifice following the maxim, necessity knows no law, as we, for instance, show in the chapter on Pristina. The streetwise informality and break breaking of rules consists not only of finding creative solutions, but also of the application and exploitation of uh, unwritten and vernacular rules of interaction that do not correspond to the official rules. Also here, social interaction is never far away. For example, in terms of uh, the eye contact and the gestures needed to negotiate one's movement in concert with other participants in traffic. People manage their co-presence in streets through forms of what Jim Conley, a sociologist, describes as mobile looking, identifying scans and the exchange of fleeting focused uh, glances. As, uh, as we as already indicated, our focus is not only on mobility, but also on dwelling and how the rapid increase in vehicular traffic has made it difficult to dwell on urban streets without cars. So and I have some images here of, um, of uh, street situations in, in different cities, Bucharest, Moscow, um, where you see you can see kind of these clashes between uh, different uh, modalities. Um, it speaks for itself that uh, that uh, the car mobility literature has neglected forms of dwelling or immobility and the convivial aspects of street life, which primarily emerge by virtue of pedestrian and other slow and non motorized traffic uh, modalities. Nevertheless, street life has changed in terms of traffic interaction, the nature of fleeting encounters, the forms and patterns of communication, and the formal rules and informal codes governing conduct. Pedestrians, for example, experience limitations to their mobility, as you can kind of see here, yeah, um, due to the new post-socialist traffic regime that prior prioritizes private car mobility. Before pedestrians experienced safe, experience safer streets because of the sparseness of motorized traffic on the socialist. But the post socialist emphasis on mobility is so pronounced that, as a chapter on Tbilisi shows, for example, neighborhood sociabilities, groups of men hanging out on streets and squares in urban neighborhoods are stigmatized or even criminalized. With pronounced their pronounced immobility, they challenge the post-socialist paradigm of mobility. So, just uh, uh, two, three sentences as uh, as as a conclusion. So, our book is engaged. We are in favor of non-motorized uh, forms of of mobility, in favor of walking, cycling, and public transport, and we're trying to make a, a clear case uh, for that. Uh, we also point at sort of the socialist legacy of uh, 
electric public transport, which constitutes a socialist legacy that may be revitalized to achieve sustainable urban futures and inspire other cities shaping, let's say, future urban uh, reality. So the socialist ghost of public transport, particularly electric transport, um, has lingered on, uh, which after a period of infrastructural decline and disinvestment is now turning into, into an asset um, uh, of these cities. So instead of adopting the usual transitology from socialism to post-socialism, we propose a reverse trajectory from fossil fuel private car mobility to electric public transport mobility uh, inherited from the socialist uh, past. I think I can stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea, for this really fascinating uh, the presentation of a fascinating book project. And now we're really looking forward to reading it, uh, it uh, uh, soon. Kevin, over, over to you. Hello. Um, it's nice to be here. I was mentioning right before we started that I guess in 2018, I was a guest researcher in Regensburg. And so it's nice to be back virtually. And um, many, many years before that, a lifetime ago, I was a student in the Netherlands in Nijmegen. So there's that interesting connection as well. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a bit of my research. Um, now, I don't actually work on street names or street naming as my primary topic in any way. Um, this research kind of came about as a backdrop for the things that I did want to research about uh, urban society in Sarajevo and uh, namely um, looking at language and uh, language ideologies, linguistics over the past several centuries and placing it within an urban setting. And so um, when I came down to the concrete of it, looking at the streets and the sidewalks that people were walking, of course, I had to pay attention to the names. And what started as a backdrop kind of became an article of its own. And so this is what I'll be sharing today. Um, I'll go ahead and start my presentation here. And um, all right, I think you can all see it, yeah? Um, okay, so... Um, I'm calling this Renaming Memory Lane. It's about street naming practices in San Ivo from the Ottoman period to the post-socialist post-war present. Um, I decided to go with practices rather than street names because the practices themselves change uh, quite a bit over time. When we think of street names, we tend to think of commemorative names, uh, streets named after historical figures or authors, poets, artists, philosophers, whatever. Um, and politicians, of course, generals. And this is a relatively recent practice. So I want to actually start by going back to Sarajevo in the Ottoman period. And just looking at um, some of the bridges to begin with. So um, here's the Chumorea Bridge. And this, this bridge is named uh, for Chumar, which is uh, coal. Um, it was connected to the, the sword makers market where the sword makers guild would come to the bridge and dump their hot coals into the river. And so the name of this bridge comes from this practice and how people engaged with the space. Um, moving to the next bridge here, um, we have Latinska Chupria. And this is called Latinska or Latin bridge. Um, because it connects to Latin Luke, which is the historically the Catholic enclave of Sarajevo. Um, originally, this is where the stonemasons from Dubrovnik settled when they built much of the city. Um, moving forward, we can see uh, Tsarava Chupria. Um, here's the Emperor's Bridge. Uh, and it's named for the Emperor's Mosque that it connects to. So. Up here, we have Basharshia. This is the main marketplace. And we see here that the names of these streets come from the particular guilds that operated on these streets. Um, here in the middle, we have Mujeliti, which is the bookbinders market, and then Mali Mujeliti next to it. Uh, then Kuyunjiluk, which is uh, the goldsmiths, 
down at the bottom, Chochiluk, which are uh, the furriers in the fur trade. Uh, Chismejiluk on the side there for the boot makers. And a little over to the side here, we have the collection of little markets called Tulkovke, which is where um, you had women working in the marketplace primarily, which is where this name comes from. So we have another kind of street name that comes up in this period where we see these little streets here. There's um, from left to right, Haji Petrovica, uh, Julagina, and Kralevica. And these are family names and they come about usually on these very small alleys, um, a sokak really, where you have this prominent family living and it's, there's a direct connection between the family living on the street and the name, on the, name of the street. And this is an Orthodox neighborhood largely. Um, then here you have two of the main streets in town. Um, Chamalusha on top, and then Ferhadia down below. And these are both named after the neighborhoods of the same names. The neighborhoods themselves took the names from mosques in the neighborhoods, which was uh, the Mahala or neighborhood is kind of the lowest administrative division within the empire at the time that was centered around a mosque. So Ferhadia goes past the Ferhadbeg mosque and then uh, Chemalusha by the Hoja Kamaluddin Mosque. So Chemalusha is Kamal's street in this way. Now, this map isn't actually from the Ottoman period. It's from the very first days of the Austro-Hungarian occupation. So this was about 1880, I think this map was drawn. And you can see here that one of the large streets which used to be called Tashlihanska, named after the stone Karavanser, the stone in Tashlihan, is now uh, Franz Josef Street. You can see Josipa in the middle there. And this is the first proper commemorative naming in the Habsburg period. Um, this is named after, of course, Austrian Emperor Franz Josef. And to the right of it, on the bottom, you see the officer's casino. Um, this is today's Dom Armie. This continues to be this kind of military building. And then another name that comes up very early here is uh, Filipovich Plots. Um, the square used to be called, originally it was called Siaset Medan, which means government square or punishment square, because this is where public punishments and executions were held. Um, over time, it took the name Atmedan, which means horse square because this served as the primary horse market in the city. And when um, Austro-Hungarian General Filipovich came in, um, in 1878, he set up his barracks here and the square took his name. So um, moving into more firmly into the Austro-Hungarian era, um, we can see here that now the, the barracks has taken the name of Franz Josef, and so has the square. It's no longer uh, Filipovich, it's now Franz Josef Square. Um, one of the big developments that happened in the early Austro-Hungarian period is the regulation of the river. And this happened under the Austro-Hungarian governor of Bosnia, uh, Johann von Apol. And so here you have the the walkway, the embankment being called Apolova, Obola, or um, Apokai, I believe in German, K. Okay. And um, then up here, you have one of the first commemorative streets that was um, in place where one of the things you don't see this wide scale renaming of streets in this period, but when a new street is built, it typically takes this. Um, commemorative conventional form of naming. So here you have Rudolf after Franz Josef's son, um, who I believe uh, had committed suicide the same year that um, the street was built in the, the Meierling hunting lodge incident. And it leads right up to the cathedral. And then moving to a newer part that's being developed, you have the, the first museum coming about. Uh, and a train station being built. So you have Kolodvorska, train station street, 
And then this walkway along the river where it was again developed is named after Benny Kale, uh, Kale of Shetelishte. And he was the Austro-Hungarian Joint Minister of Finance who uh, kind of served as the colonial administrator of Bosnia during this time. Now, um, when you have the Kingdom of Yugoslavia coming into being at the beginning of World War One, end of World War One, excuse me, you have this wide scale renaming. Anything that had an Austro-Hungarian name needs to go. So, uh, and this is very clear. These these names are all named after Yugoslav, primarily Serb, but not exclusively figures. So, a lot of generals from uh, the First World War um and also the balkan wars you have um in uh king peter of course and then uh one street that right before the the war actually during the war um had been renamed after franz ferdinand the archduke by that time uh he had already been assassinated is now being named for um the crown prince alexander and then becomes king alexander a little bit later uh, and you do have some Croatian names in here as well. Um, Zvonimir, for example, um, Ludovic Guy. Um, but I'll go back to the map at this point. And now you'd see that the square, which was Franz Josef Square before that, the horse market, Filipovic, is now named after Tsar Dushan. So this is kind of this classic kind of nation building idea of having this. Um, medieval figure from from Serbia um, who's kind of idolized in this golden age mentality um, having a square next to it is Rankovic square um, not Alexander Rankovic but this is a uh, Svetozar Rankovic who was um, a, a Chetnik and uh, commander in the Balkan Wars and in World War One um, and then Konak is now named after Nikola Pašić who was the prime minister of first kingdom of Serbia, then Yugoslavia, um, who made his career opposing the Ottoman and Habsburg empires. He was the founder, or at least leader of the Serbian radical party. Um, up here we see the, the waterfront K has been named Vojvod de Stepa um, after, again, a general from the first world war who, um, successfully fought against the Habsburgs in, in that war. And here, what was Franz Josef is now King Peter Street. So that you see these continuities coming up. Um, here's a street named after Vukaradzic, and then of course, King Alexander, and then the new crown prince, Peter II, in this case. Um, back over to this neighborhood, Again, you have uh, a general, um, Vojvoda Putnik, from the First World War. Then there's the uh, writer and poet from Dubrovnik, Ivan Gundelich, towards the bottom. And now the walkway is called uh, the Woodrow Wilson Walkway, of course, because of his 14 points and um, national self-determination, which was a major um, founding principle for Yugoslavia in the post-war order. Um, so this picture is very blurry, but one thing I want to mention is the, the bridge, the Latin bridge that I talked about earlier. In the previous map, it was left unnamed. In this one from the same year, this is 1929, it's clearly named the Princip Bridge, uh, Princip Popmost. And this is kind of a, a contentious point among historians from what I've noticed. Um, there's a debate as to whether or not the first Yugoslavia actually named the bridge, the Princip Bridge. Um, Paul Miller insists that it is um, a misunderstanding that it never actually happened. Nevertheless, here is a map printed um, in Germany, actually in Leipzig uh, from this time period showing it. Um, more importantly, um, whether or not they actually named it uh, Princip Most or not, uh, we do have it coming up later with the proclamation of the independent state of Croatia, the fascist puppet state, the NDH. And this is a newspaper from that period. Just to remind you that it's from this Nazi period, we have a uh, contemporary humor with um, some anti-Semitic jokes 
And um, in the same edition, we have the new names of streets in Sarajevo uh, and bridges and squares as well receive new names. And this happened um, very early on in the occupation where the cabinet of the, the mayor decided on a set of new names for pretty much anything that spoke about Yugoslavia. So starting off with the waterfront walkway, um, it's now named after Adolf Hitler. Um, King Alexander is now named after Ante Pavlich. Interestingly enough, what was King Peter Street is just called street number one. And one very likely reason for this is the, that the independent state of Croatia did seek a king. And this was Tomislav II, who was an Italian noble from the uh, Savoy dynasty. And he actually refused to be crowned for a variety of reasons. So they left the name number one as a placeholder until he took this position. Um, the Wilson walkway is now named after Mussolini. Um, Pashic, Nikola Pashic Street is now named after Slavko Kvaternik, who was um, a co-founder of the Ustasha movement and the head of the military of the Endeha. And um, again, we, we see like some very clear uh, ideological grounding here. Um, Dr. Ante Starcevich. Interestingly, with um, Kocicheva, this was named after a Bosnian Serb poet from Banja Luka, I believe. Um, it's now getting the name Talali, which is uh, a very archaic Ottoman guild name. These are the street criers. So they're actually resurrecting this old Ottoman name. And this happens in a few instances. Um, again, uh, Vukarajic's street gets renamed and so forth. I'm going to jump to the squares here. Um, just briefly, uh, Tsar Dushan has now been renamed after uh, a Bosniak poet and political figure who died um, right around this time. And then the other walkway on the other side of the bank um, had been renamed Francuska during Yugoslavia, the first Yugoslavia as um, in, in honor of uh, Yugoslavia's ally in the war of France. So this is the French coast, you could say. And now it's being named after um, the head of the Ulema uh, right up until this time. So they've adopted uh, a very Muslim name for this one, um, specifically the head of the Islamic community. Um, and finally, we get to the bridges. And with the bridges, we see that they've all returned to their Ottoman names. Um, Tsarava Chupria is again the Emperor's Bridge when it had previously been named after Zeraic, who was another assassin um, who before uh, Gavrilo Princip had attempted an assassination of the Bosnian governor on that bridge and failed and committed suicide with the final bullet in his revolver. And whether or not uh, Latinska Chupria was ever officially named Principal of most, um, it's clear at this point that the Endeha is renaming it Latinska Chupria. So uh, um, whether it was official or not, they're returning the old name. And um, so now we'll jump to the partisan period. Um, this is very early on in uh, Yugoslavia, second Yugoslavia, socialist Yugoslavia. And we see here that some of the names from the first Yugoslavia have returned. Tsar Dushan Park is back. Um, Vojvoda Stepa is back. Um, in this case, uh, Princip of Most is clearly the official name and recognized as such. Um, what was once uh, King um, Franz Josef Street and then King Peter and then Street Number One is now named JNA Street, the Yugoslavenska Narodna Armia. Um, and over here, um, what was Konak and then Nikola Pashic and then Kvatrnik is now Nuria Pozderats, who was um, vice president of Avnoi. He was an anti-fascist. So going from a fascist to an anti-fascist. And interestingly enough, um, I find this one kind of clever. What was once uh, Francuska Obola, French embankment, 
is now named after the Paris Commune. So they've taken the French name, the French theme, and adjusted it towards uh, socialist and revolutionary values. Um, just to give you a little, uh, of course, the main street is Marshal Latita, as it is today. Um, this name hasn't changed, and I'll come back to that. Um, here's Svetozar Markovic, Nikola Tesla. And just a little hint at when this actually was um, made. Uh, what's now Ali Pashina Ulitsa, and this map is called Moskovska. So this is before Tito's break with Stalin. Um, so you have Moscow Street, and coming down here, you have um, Red Army um, Boulevard. And Mussolini's walkway has now returned to Wilson's. Now, a, a couple decades later in socialist Yugoslavia, you have a very interesting book coming out. And this book is The Streets and Squares of Sarajevo by Alia Betic. And Betic was, he was a historian, uh, an Ottomanist, but also became very engaged in the preservation of cultural and material history in Sarajevo, heritage studies. And he had a state position for this. And he wrote this magnificent book. Um, you can see he finished the manuscript in 1970 on the 20th anniversary of the liber liberation and socialist development of the city of Sarajevo. And in this book, he details 665 streets and squares and bridges in Sarajevo, um, giving every name that each one of them had from the Ottoman period to the present, his present, uh, 1970 in this case, explaining who these figures were. Um, in the case of the old Ottoman streets, um, what trades were there, um, what they were engaged in, um, just giving a lot of background. And then he also does a statistical analysis showing you know, 39% of the streets in socialist Yugoslavia were named for Serbs, 38% um, for Muslims, 15% for Croats, et cetera, et cetera. So really an outstanding work of linguistic landscape studies and street naming decades ahead of its time. I mean, this is 1973 that is published. So really fascinating work. And I'm uh, here, he's actually talking about the Woodrow Wilson walkway noting that in his own time, uh, starting around 1960, they got rid of the name Woodrow Wilson and named it the Youth Walkway um, because it provided this intimate setting for the youth to walk at night. And it's one of the few streets, I think the only street that doesn't have any street lights. So uh, also gave more than intimacy, some discretion as well. Um, now, jumping to the present day, I'm not gonna to talk too much about what happened in the 90s with street naming. Some of it, um, you can guess. Obviously, um, some of the old figures are gone. There's no park named Sardushan anymore. It returned to the Ottoman name, Atmedan. Um, you have names like uh, Obalakuli Nabana after a medieval Bosnian king. Um, who had nothing to do with the street at all. It's purely commemorative. Um, the street of the Yugoslav army, the JNA, is now the Green Berets, and then part of it's called Defenders of Sarajevo. So you have obviously some like modern nation building work. You have uh, some of the Ottoman names being returned. Uh, Marshal Atita remains to this day. There was an attempt to rename it Izetbegovic, during uh, Izzet Begovic's lifetime, this is the first president of Bosnia, and he refused this and said, history does not begin with us. Um, after he died, there was another attempt, and it was only stopped when um, there were protests and people took to the street, waving banners saying, this is Marshal Tito Street. Um, but what's most interesting for me about the modern period that I'm uh, going to end on here is... Um, again, Latinska Chupria returns to its name and so forth, is um, if you look here, this is Konak. Um, they, in, I guess, 2014 or 15, installed new commemorative plaques on all of the street names. Um, 
and they're very interesting. So here's an example of one. And you see what they've done is um, they've actually used Ali Abetic's work to show the history of the street in every name that it has had over time. And so you end up with this very interesting juxtaposition of figures. In this case, you have the Konak, which is the residence for the authorities of first the Ottoman Empire and then the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Then you have Nikola Pašić, whose career was built around opposing these two empires. Then you have uh, Kvatrny, co-founder of uh, the Ustasha, whose career was built on opposing Nikola Pašić in his Yugoslavia. And then you have Nuri Pozdrat, who, as an anti-fascist, of course, was dedicated to opposing Kvatanik and everything that he stood for. So a very strong juxtaposition here. And then finally, the restoration of the old name. And um, so this is what I call the, the meta commemorative turn, where now it's the commemorative names that are being commemorated. Um, interestingly enough, you see at the bottom, this plaque was paid for by USAID, the US uh, Development Agency, um, their Swedish counterpart, SIDA, and then the municipality of Old Town Sarajevo, of Stary Grad. And it's one of 250 plaques that have been put up. Um, as to the motivations of this, I can't say that it's strictly to render clear the ideological strata of the city and the stakes engaged, the, the stakes that people are engaged with in, in naming streets, but rather um, there's actually a, a purely economic motive behind at least some of this, is that many of the old streets in Basharshia, uh, their names had never changed. They're still the original names of the guilds, uh, Kuyunjiluk and um, uh, Chizmejiluk and so forth, uh, Mujeliti. And a lot of people in today's Sarajevo know what some of these names mean, but probably not all of them. But more importantly, tourists would have no idea. Um, maybe people coming from Turkey would know, of, could recognize a few of them. But um, in part, this was done by an association of craftsmen in Sarajevo um, who kind of took the lead on this project in order to show the authenticity of the handcrafts that they were producing on these streets. So that the goldsmiths on Kuyunjiluk have been there for hundreds of years and um, that this is a traditional craft. So in a way, it's this bid for authenticity that kind of as a, a side effect has this interesting meta commemorative turn of exposing the ideological layers of the city. And in adopting Ali Abedic's kind of um, neutral historian uh, tone that he takes, um, it in whatever sense neutralizes to some degree um, these various names in putting them all up there in plain sight for everyone to see. And um, that's it. So thank you very much.